So a uh, quick look, the three battles that I've chosen to pick out here, and in truth, I could have really picked six to cover, are going to be New Chapelle running on the 10th to the 12th slash 13th of March, 1915. Orbers Ridge, which takes place on the 9th of May. And then Loose, or Loss, as it's properly called, running from the 25th to the 27th, with a caveat that there's actually quite a lot of fighting goes on into October that is quite often rolled in to the Battle of Loose. But in reality, it's the three-day affair is the uh, is the meat of that fight. So let's have a look at the first of those battles. And I do stress, these will be a fairly quick um, run-through because there's uh, quite a lot to cover, and I'm not going to go battalion by battalion, rather try and give a flavour of the battlefield as a whole. Um, New Chapelle, of course, is known really as an Indian army attack. It's actually about 50-50 troops, about 50% British of the 4th Corps and about 50% Indian of the Indian Corps. So this is the area of the battlefield it's going to be fought over. And it's a very small area, actually. New Chapelle as a, as a battlefield is, is relatively tiny. It's probably two miles from these two positions here, the key position of the Moated Grange, German strong point and Port Arthur, which for those of you guys that know the battlefields will recognize this little spot down here, which is the New Chapelle Indian Memorial. Interestingly, though, the battlefield takes a bit of a dogleg here. It's almost a right angle. Um, and the intention here, and this is where we can look at the British intentions for 1915 and whether they're a bit high in the sky sometimes. There are multiple intentions. First of all, capture New Chapelle village. Well, that's realistic. So the village we see in the middle of the screen, capture it. The next is to capture the Bois de Biais, which is a wooded area that you can see a bit further up the screen there. Really important part of the ground that needs to be captured. Beyond that and off screen is something called the Orbers Ridge. Um, this is going to be the subject of both this and the following attack. Just a, a point on the Orbers Ridge here. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but you could walk across the Orbers Ridge. You could walk over the other side. You could turn around, see a completely flat piece of ground and not realize that there was anything even resembling a ridge there. It's very, very low. But as we saw on that previous drone shot, any elevation in 1915 is going to be useful. And that's the, the kind of key to the Orbis attack. So there are going to be two prongs to this attack. Uh, it's going to be 4th Corps, uh, going to be attacking basically through the village. And then you've got the Indian Corps who are going to be attacking um, at a right angle around this area called Port Arthur. And the idea is they're going to snip off this section of Western Front you can see the German lines as they stood and the British lines as they stand at that time. And ideally, they're going to launch what is euphemistically, I think, perhaps known in, the, in 1915 as an into the blue attack. This is a very general British doctrine which says, break through the enemy lines, do what you can, kind of open a gap in the enemy lines and something good will happen. So there are these kind of general looks at what might be possible, but into the blue is a concept that's to get through the enemy lines first and then something good will happen. So as we overfly here, we're kind of on the, uh, we've, we've got the moated Grange, that um, key German strong point off to our left, and we've got New Chapelle Village kind of slightly to our right. Uh, Bois de Bia in the distance. What actually happens is the Brits get out of their trenches and they manage to attack and capture the German front line fairly easily, it should be said. The Germans at this point have not really developed a, what we sometimes refer to as a defence in depth. It's elastic, and we'll come back to that, but it's not deep. It's only really one heavily loaded front line trench. And once that falls, the Germans have to pull back to some other barrier. And in this case, they're going to be really pulling back almost to the Bois de, to the Bois de BA in the distance. So they'll learn from this in between these two battles. But actually, there's significant success, less so on the Indian Corps front, but more on the uh, more on the 4th Corps front, where 8th Division do very well in this sector. Just moving on to give you an idea, you can see this blue line marked on the map here. This is approximately the location that is captured during the fight. So limited around the Indian Corps front. Partly that's because of uh, some stubborn German defences just uh, north of Port Arthur. Um, partly it's because of confusion. So the, the way that this battle really rolls out, you can kind of sum up in the following ways. Initial success. So Germans do pretty well at the start. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> the British do pretty well at the start. 
the Germans struggle to a certain extent, partly because there's an effective bombardment. It's not a big bombardment, and by 1918 standards, it's going to be minuscule, almost not worth registering. This is about 90 guns firing thousands of rounds over a few hours. But what they do is they manage to effectively target the German front line and the wire in front of it, more importantly, and they create gaps which can then be assaulted. So the bombardment is effective. There's also numerous instances of individual bravery which unlock different sectors of the Western Front. And this is something we see a lot, particularly in 1915. Sometimes the difference between success and failure is quite simply one man. It's, it's really incredible. Um, New Chapelle is captured, albeit not all of it. The moated grange, the area on the map there, that holds out pretty strongly. Um, stubborn defensive positions. The Bois de Billets is never captured and actually puts down some quite heavy fire on the advancing Brits and eventually checks their attack. Communications, though, is the big problem. The communications break down quick. And communications, particularly wired communications, break down very quick in an area that's filled with artillery shells. Artillery shells are fantastic at breaking communications cables. And actually, the, the lack of exploitation on that first day, why the Brits don't end up in the Bois de BA or even on the Orvis Ridge, is really down to communication. And it's a bit of a unique situation um, in comparison to battles from 50 or 100 years before, because previously you've got generals that can see every, every soldier on their battlefield. They can send runners out and communicate them, and simply with trench warfare, you just can't do that. And that doesn't really get solved until about 1918. Um, in addition to that, the Germans, uh, the the famous uh, the famous comment here: are three things certain in life, uh, which is life, death, and German counterattacks. Very true on the Western Front. If any any attacks ever come in against the Germans, they're going to throw a counterattack back. That's their doctrine. They'll sometimes recoil, a bit like a boxer being punched. They'll bounce back onto the ropes, but they're they're going to come forward again. And the reason they're going to do that is because they know if the Brits have captured. A German trench, amongst other things, just from a practical point of view, trenches only have a fire step dug into one side of them. The fire step is the thing you stand on to shoot over. They're seven feet deep apart from that. And the fire step's only dug towards the Brits. So when the Brits capture a German trench, you can't actually defend out of it. It's basically impossible to defend out of unless you, what they call, reverse a trench and dig a ditch into the other side so you can step up on the thing. That takes time. So the Germans typically will wait until you get to your furthest point of advance, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're low on ammunition, you've got loads of wounded, and then they're going to launch their counterattack. And they do that here at New Chapelle. Interestingly, it's not super successful. It doesn't actually dislodge the Brits. What it does do, though, in enough with enough force is it dissuades them from continuing the forward motion. So it checks the British advance. The British, in turn, check the German advance. And the Brits, in a sense, settle down and say, right, we've actually captured a good bit of ground here. In addition, we need to mention lack of reinforcements. The reinforcements for New Chapelle are kept a couple of miles back. When communications break down, very difficult to get the reinforcements brought up. They're kept back to keep them out of shell fire and to uh, keep an element of surprise, by the way, but they're too far back. And by the time they're needed, it's too late and they get thrown into the wrong place at the wrong time. The addition to that, and both, and this one relates, of course, to reinforcements, is the lack of supplies. Men at the front, being short on ammunition. Well, it's the reinforcements that are bringing those up. And if they can't do that, we can't push forward. So there's a couple of reasons for that. And then finally, the story of 1915, lack of shells. Hardly any shells in the British Army in 1914 or in 1915. And of those, hardly any of them go bang when you want them to either. So it's uh, it's a pretty depressing state of affairs as far as the gunners go. But New Chapelle is, you could, I think, argue, not a bad first attempt. And it is the first formal British over-the-top assault, um, offensive assault of the Great War. So the battlefield today, I just find fascinating. I just want to do a quick spin around here of the New Chapelle Indian Memorial. Um, really, really stunning location. It's on those crossroads, Port Arthur, sometimes referred to as La Bombe Crossroads. British casualties for the battle, about 12,800, which include about 4,000 Indian casualties. German casualties, less than that, 8,500. This um, memorial here is, is a real stunner. You can actually see New Chapelle just going out screen on the left there and the famous Bois de Bia in the distance. One interesting thing, if you guys have been to visit this one, is it's actually covered in battle damage. And that battle damage is from 1940, from when Guderian's panzers come rolling through here. There's actually a pitched fight 
in and around this cemetery. So it's scattered with, with uh, battle damage from 1940. But New Chapelle comes to an end. And the next thing that's going to happen here is the assault on Orbers Ridge. Um, now, spoiler alert, this does not go well. Um, but it's worth considering because actually there are lessons learned in a very broad sense, but there are many of the same mistakes made and they're important when it comes to understanding the Battle of Luce afterwards. So in short, this is going to be a single day, two pronged assault from either side of New Chapelle with the idea being to capture that Orbers Ridge in part to support French assaults, which are going on in two key places further to the south. One's called Vimy Ridge, Vimy Ridge. and the other is Notre Dame de Lorette or the Lorette Spur, um, both of which are fascinating fights in their own, in their own right. Um, the main reason for this attack, or one of the main ones, is to threaten Lille here. And it's hoped that by threatening Lille, German troops who are fighting hard on the Lorette Spur and at Vimy Ridge are going to be, have to be redeployed to defend Lille. So to free up a bit of uh, a bit of movement space for the French. Now, it's not going to work out that way, and for a couple of reasons. There are going to be two assaults. One's around the famous 1916 Fromel battlefield, and the second is going to be at a place called richebourg la sometimes better known as the Rue du Bois. Let's have a look at them in turn. So the northern one, this is the Fromel battlefield with a map overlaid over the satellite image to show you the general area. The idea here is to punch through an area outside the village of Fromel and around an area known as locally as Rouge Bank or Rouge Banks sometimes. And that's identified by this curving road in the distance. For those of you that know Fromel, this is really the limit of exploitation for the 1916 battle. There's also a key part here that's forming. This part of the line is going to be really important. It's known in 1916, incidentally, not at this point, but the, the line still exists as the sugar loaf and it's a salient that sticks out into no man's land and allows importantly enfilade or sideways fire to be dropped on the attacking troops um the intention here as i say is to punch through get through from el village and eventually up to the orbers ridge and then following that we've got down in the south the other if you like the sister attack to this and this is to take place i'll just try and um identify the area for you this road here this is the main road with New Chapelle under this map sitting just here. So if you remember that right-hand turn in the road, that's just about here. The line has moved forward slightly because it's been captured in the March attack, but this is the, the famous um, Indian Memorial just here. The road that runs along it that many people give the name of the battle to is this one right here. This is called the Rue du Bois, very famous road to troops in 1915. And running off that is a much smaller track here this is called the Cinder Track. This is going to be very famous for 1915. It's also going to be the site of a battle called the Boar's Head in 1916-17. Um, important to note here, two farms, and the whole landscape is studded with farms, of course, when the BEF get there in, 19, in 1914, 1915. These farms are actually quite often a really good opportunity for defence. So what the Germans are doing is they're taking the farms behind their own lines and they're going to reinforce them, and they're going to place machine guns in the upper stories and turn them into mini fortresses. If you know Waterloo, you can imagine Hougoumont and La Haison being the, the bastions for, for Wellington's defensive lines. Well, this is the same, except they're behind the front line. So they're going to be firing over their own front line troops' heads. But interestingly and importantly, they can easily hit the Brits as they advance. This is going to be vital to the story of Orbers Ridge. So back to the north briefly, and I'll just run this drone shot so you can have a look at the, the battlefield. As I say, this is absolutely nailed on the Australian battlefield of 1916. In fact, this is the Australian Memorial Park today. The attack came in from the bottom left and was going across to this. If you remember the road with that distinct turn in it, this is Rouge Bon here. So the German line is in and around this area, and the Brits just simply get annihilated trying to get across it. There's no... Honestly, there's no good thing that you can say about the northern part of the Orbers Ridge attack, apart from there's some damn brave lads doing the attacking. Very weak bombardment, terrible wire cutting, which leaves only a couple of gaps in the enemy wire. And of course, enemy machine guns are just going to be trained directly at those gaps. Lots of enemy wire is another one, sometimes as far as 25 to 30 feet thick. And we're not talking agricultural farmers' field barbed wires today. We're talking really aggressive coils and coils and coils of the stuff. Um, as a result of these basically horrific casualties that are sustained on uh, going across these fields, 
casualty evacuation chain, so the uh, the medical side of things, they're just overwhelmed. You know, they've planned for bad attacks. The worst they've seen so far is New Chapelle. Nobody expects 50, 60, 70% casualties to battalions, and they're just ripped to pieces. And very lucky guys are the first ones that that get back into the medical evacuation chain, maybe get wounded straight away. But some of the other guys, you know, it's just a, it's a death sentence because they just get swamped. Um, the real problems here are lack of surprise, which is partly an issue at New Chapelle. The other thing is having a weak bombardment is a, is a double-edged sword. Having any bombardment is a double-edged sword. It's, of course, going to give the game away that something's happening in that sector. But if it's strong enough, you can get away with it. But a weak bombardment is a lose-lose because not only are you giving away the element of surprise, but you're actually not doing any damage. So this is what happens at Orbers Ridge in the north. Shells, again, terrible. The shell scandal, famous shell scandal of 1915 will come about as a result of this battle. Basically, not many shells. They're not getting produced quickly enough at home. And those that do are really poor quality. The fuses particularly, something like 25 to 30% of shells don't go off when they hit the ground. That's a terrible, terrible thing at the time. And again, communications. Basically, it's figured out that as soon as a battle starts in 1915, that the whole thing devolves into a mess. Let's um, have a look at the south here. This is a view along the famous cinder track. So we're looking from the British front lines here. Two battalions assault in this area. There's actually multiple waves, but the two that stick in my mind is going to be the, the Royal Munster Fusiliers and uh, the Sangport Battalion of the, uh, of the Surreys as well. They're going to be attacking left and right of this track as we go. And I'll just run the drone so you can get a look. We are looking directly down that track then. So slightly to the right, you'll see a little clump of trees. That is the site of Firm Corps Davu, which is one of those reinforced farms. To the left of that, um, not really anything marking it today. And the left side of the track was the other farm, um, which is Firm Dubois. Both of those are studded with machine guns. They've not been effectively targeted by British artillery. The German front line, incidentally, is about where this field boundary is in front of us. So running left, right in front of us here. The idea is to storm through that, go on, capture those farms, push on beyond those, and eventually get over to the Orbis Ridge, which is at about 10 o'clock as we look at it at the moment, but four or five, four miles off. It's a disaster. Probably not a single man makes it beyond the German front line. There may be a pocket here and there that make it. The Northampton to attack from the right-hand side of our screen, possibly get into the second lines. But in essence, men are cut down before they even go over the top. There's thick wire here, poor wire cutting, weak bombardment, poor planning, and those fortified farms are just ripping in over the, over the heads of their own frontline troops to hit the guys in the fields. number of the St. Ports lads, uh, they're, they're going to actually talk about being stuck in this little patch of field directly in front of us for hours and hours on end on that day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a horrific loss. Uh, there's a lack of learning basically from the issues that are found at New Chapelle. Um, and you know, these lessons aren't free either British casualties. This is about in terms of great war battles from a British point of view, it's about the biggest disparity you'll see of any battle on the Western front. We lose 11,600 men killed, wounded, and missing, compared to German losses a little under a tenth of that, 1,550. You don't get a worse day in the office than that in the First World War on the Western Front. Uh, this is a man by the name of Tony or Anthony Wilding. He's a New Zealander. He is, believe it or not, nine times Wimbledon champion. He's the David Beckham of his era, and he's almost unknown today. He is a, a fantastic doubles player, wins Wimbledon a couple of times, singles as well. Um, he's a, an outstanding tennis player. He's a bit of a daredevil too. He famously is, is due to go to a tennis corn, tournament down in Cornwall one time on his motorbike. And he's famously seen with his motorbike, with this tennis racket strapped to the back of it. And on his way down to the tennis tournament, he finds that there's a motorbike race going from Land's End to John O'Groats. He decides to cancel the tennis tournament and wins the bike race all the way through the United Kingdom with a tennis racket stuck to the back of his, to the back of his bike. He's a fantastic character. He's tragically killed with the Royal Marines fighting at Orbis Ridge, um, unusually using an armoured car, which is another story for another day. Um, and then the other image on the right here, this is the Latore Memorial to the Missing and Cemetery. 
So large number of those that are killed in 1915 are going to end up on the Latore Memorial. In short, Orbis Ridge is an utter, utter disaster. But it doesn't mean the Brits won't try again, and they're going to be trying in September, this time over these battlefields here. This is, of course, the Battle of Luz or Loss. Now, it looks something like this. This is the, the area of the battlefield as we see it today. Um, for anybody ever visiting the battlefield, you can see, importantly, a couple of key areas. So if you want to understand the northern and southern boundaries, which are about six miles apart, these are the two things you need to look at. One, uh, and if anybody's ever been to France here, you'll know these. As you cross from Calais and you drive down the autoroute de Anglais, the same one that takes you to the south of France, on the left-hand side, about 50 miles into your journey, you'll see a couple of really big, clear pyramids in the distance, a pair of them, twin pyramids. That's these two things. They're called the double crassier. Uh, they're actually slag heaps from the mining that goes on in this very flat area pre-war. So this is the double crassier, marks the southern boundary of the loose battlefield. Then up in the top, harder to see here, this is the Labasse Canal, marks the northern boundary, effectively the northern boundary. In between that is this area that's going to be attacked. Starting in the north, what's known as the Scottish attack. So the 9th and 15th Division, including James, your relative here, who's going to be attacking a very famous, and very deadly place called the Hohenzollern Redoubt. In the centre, we have uh, an attack which is going to be really problematic because of these two villages. This is going to be between the villages of Los and Ulu, both of which are astride a road, left-right running road here that you can see. This is a really important road as far as the battle goes. And then down in the south, you're going to have um, two divisions in this area attacking Loose Village itself. Now, this is going to be a, an interesting part of the fight, and we'll come on to that just now. So this is the double crassier at the top, the southern part of the Loose Battlefield boundary. I was just going to run the drone over here because on the opening day of the Battle of Loose, this is about the most successful part of the entire battlefield. The London Irish are famously going to attack across this ground directly as we're going now. There's loads of stories in the Great War of people kicking footballs about in no man's land. Very rarely happens, but it does happen here. London Irish famously kick a football over the top and they're going to advance into the enemy trenches, which are actually slightly to the left of the double crassier. So you can see Loose Village just in the distance there on the left. They're going to get into the village in the south on that first day. That's utterly shocking, but very, very impressive. Now, it's not all successful here, though. The south is the most successful. In the center, there's mixed success, really. And what we find in this area here, so the bulk of the battlefield, some troops are going to get into Hulu village, which is here. Some troops are going to get even up to this road here. The Germans really struggle to react to this first level of attack, and they're actually going to, going to sway back quite far. This is where the idea of an elastic defense comes in. They're going to bend but not break. And this is the, the story, really, of the, the German defense of 1915. Um, okay. They're going to, overnight, they're going to, going to react to these attacks. And they're actually going to reoccupy a number of the positions they lost on the previous day. But in the south, enfilade fire from the houses on the edge of Lost Village and the edge of Ulu Village are going to create a beaten zone, which is a cross lane of machine gun fires, not even aimed at individuals, but rather just filling an imaginary box of air with lead knowing that for soldier a to get from to get to his objective he's got to walk through it um it, it's that deadly um in the north things go differently it's it's definitely the toughest nut to crack on the opening day um 9th and the 15th Australia, uh, australian i've been talking about australians all week uh scottish divisions are incredibly incredibly good in the great war um, Scottish divisions are amongst the the best divisions of the entire uh, BEF. They get into the front edge of the Hohenzollern Redoubt and they actually get into a fight and almost capture and retain it. Unfortunately, a couple of things go wrong here. One is there's diff uh, pretty poor wire cutting, which is problematic in itself. The second is gas has been used on the opening day of the Battle of Luz. Gas has been used in the centre and the north and partly in the south, but not exclusively. What the problem here is that the gas used in the centre has been used really in conditions it probably shouldn't have been launched in. Because the general idea was that gas is going to sweep ahead and kill or incapacitate with chlorine German troops holding these lines here. 
in reality, what happens is that morning, the wind shifts. And because this is dependent on the wind to drift it across enemy land, this actually is going to go northwards. So the central part of the line is going to gas the northern part of the British line. It's, it's quite often said that gas blows back into the trenches. It really doesn't. It kind of, the central guys gas the guys in the north more predominantly. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not going the wrong way. It's uh, not completely, it's it's drifting northwards. Um, and that's going to cause hell for the lads attacking the Hohenzollern Redoubt. They're going to end up grabbing the front edge of it. There's going to be some really, really bitter fighting on it. We'll maybe come back to this when we hit the next map in a moment. But I just want to go to the, the second day very briefly. Um, this is, I think, uh, I don't, I should say, I don't subscribe to the lines led by Donkey's idea in the Great War. Doesn't doesn't ring true with me. Um, there are certainly some idiotic idiotic decisions made, but they're never made with with malice in mind. Um, with I think one exception in 1915, and that's this one. It's the second day of the Battle of Luce. Um, the fight is going on in Luce village, and and actually is reasonably successful in the north, uh, up towards a place called Hill 70. In the centre, though, there's a tragic decision made. Now, to put this into context, on the opening day of the Battle of Luce in the centre, those troops have attacked in between Luce and, and Ulu and got caught in that beaten zone and been smashed to bits. Those guys are regular army, pre-war professionals with tons of experience. On the second day, the reserves that are kept back behind the lines have been brought forward. They're going to launch an absolute carbon copy attack of that first day on the second day, except on the second day, they're going to be brand new troops, Kitchener's troops that have never been in a trench, let alone on the Western Front. They ne- certainly haven't been in action. They've marched basically direct from the coast, having arrived. The first two divisions of Kitchener troops, about 20,000 guys, they're going to be thrown straight into this attack in the middle of the Battle of Luce on the second day with no, ele- no element of surprise now, no gas to help them, no experience, a 20-minute artillery bombardment, which is next to useless, and they've never even seen the ground that they're attacking across. And surprise, surprise, they get absolutely massacred. Um, the Germans even dub this area as the Field of Corpses. Now, there's lots of things where you get that kind of name in the Great War, but there are literal accounts of Germans saying, we just stopped firing, couldn't do it anymore. Moving on to day three here, I'm only going to pick out one story here because it's a, it's a fascinating and tragic one in, in the same sense. don't know if anybody recognises this chap on the left here. Um, this is a young man by the name of uh, Lieutenant John Kipling, son of the famous writer Rudyard. He is going to be going into attack on the third day of the Battle of Luce, very much like the two divisions we just discussed, except this time he's going to be attacking with the 2nd Battalion of the Irish Guards. Their job is to attack not far from the field of corpses, actually, and to try and capture an area to the north of Luce Village called the Chalk Pit. Uh, John and his men are going to go into the attack that day. John's just 19, maybe eight, uh, just 18, I should say. Um, he's leading his, a platoon on that day, and he sh- probably shouldn't be there. His father has had to pull strings to get him into the army in the first place. His eyesight is shockingly bad. Um, his father gets him into the Irish Guards, and this is his very first time in action. And he's attacking across these very fields here. Uh, records tell us that this is the last place. Um, the Irish Guards actually do quite well, and they make it to the edge of Chalk Pit Wood, which is what we're looking at right here, um, beyond which is a Chalk Pit, which is the quarry that's been there since before the war. And as the Irish Guards disappear into this front hedge line here, you can just see the building in the background. They start taking fire from the building that was there at the time called Puy 14 Bis, which is a, a, a mine head and a, a structure around a mine head. And John Kipling, along with a number of Irish guards, disappear on this very spot and tragically are never seen again. Really, the Battle of Luce, of course, will go on, um, particularly around the Hohenzollern Redoubt here. So this is the the attack on the Hohenzollern made by men of the 46th North Midland Division um, amongst those men to be doing the attacking. And it's a really bitter fight that goes on much longer into October, 3rd and 12th of October, 13th of October, see additional fights. I should mention here, the Hohenzollern Redoubt has broken two of the prime British divisions in the early days of the Battle of Luce, the 9th and the 15th divisions, two hardy Scottish battalion divisions. Um, the 46th North Midlands territorials are going to be sent in after them to try and do exactly the same thing. 
they're also going to get broken and, and sadly get a really bad reputation for not failing to capture what is in reality probably an uncapturable um, objective. The Hohenzollern sadly will not be taken, but parts of it will. It's a, it's a tremendous fight and really deserves to be its, its own story on a different day. Now, just moving towards the end here, um, to sum up the Battle of Luce in 19, 1915, there are problems which really should have been seen before. Reinforcements, again, same problem as New Chapelle and Orbis Ridge, keeping the reinforcements too back, particularly reinforcing failure. So throwing troops into the area where um, on the second day, 21st and 24th div go in, they've already failed there. Could have easily easily fed them in south at Luce where there's much better chance of breakthrough. Unfortunately, that's a classic British thing in the First World War is to, is to throw troops at the bad bits, not the good. Uh, artillery, it's clear, is not enough. The numbers aren't enough. The guns aren't enough. And uh, really, the bombardments need to be far more substantial. We'll see that the following year at the Somme. Uh, communications is an ever-present problem. Everybody knows it's a problem by the by the Battle of Luce, but actually, nobody can really figure out how to get round it. The Battle of Luce is six miles six miles wide and thousands of yards deep. It's it's really tricky to solve this problem, and it's going to remain a problem for a long time. And then finally, a, a fairly unique one to Luce is rigid command structure, and this is a bit of a Victorian throwback because. Typically at Luce, it's um, the most senior officers on the battlefield are going to be lieutenant colonels, so battalion commanders. And they're really the guys that have been given all the information. And typically, they're not going to really disseminate that, disseminate that information down below about the level of captain. Now, what you find with troops going over the top in areas where you've got terrible amounts of machine gun fire, and particularly in 1915, officers who look distinctly different to their soldiers they're wearing cuff ranks, they're carrying sticks and revolvers, they're easily identifiable. Officers are going to get picked off really quick. And then when you're left with second lieutenants and sergeants and corporals to direct the attack, well, unfortunately, you haven't told them where they've got to go. So there needs to be a more flexible command structure with devolved command throughout all of the ranks. And that's a big lesson from Luce in 1915. This is a place called St. Mary's Advanced Dressing Station. Uh, it's, a, it's a really powerful one for me personally, and I highly recommend a visit. Two reasons, actually. One of them is that this grave right here is the chap that I was part of the team that discovered in 2015. He's an unknown Leicestershire Regiment soldier, um, and he was buried in 2018. That's why you see the slightly newer headstone there in terms of style. And the second one, which I think is uh, is really interesting as well, is that this grave here, um, this is in fact the grave of... Lieutenant John Kipling of the Irish Guards. Now, John's father, Rudyard, and his mother, Carrie, who are both seen in this smaller picture down here, they were devastated by John's loss. In fact, there's a great film about it, My Boy Jack. Um, in interestingly, John Kipling, never known as Jack. If you'd called him Jack, he wouldn't even turn around. He had no idea who you're talking about. My Boy Jack comes from the poem that Rudyard Kipling writes about Jack Tar, a, ta uh, a sailor missing in 1915. Um, John's body is actually discovered in the 1920s and he's buried as an unknown soldier. Um, and it's only in 1992 that after some work is done, it's realised that John Kipling is actually buried in St Mary's Advanced Dressing Station. I think what's really tantalising about this story is that Rudyard and Carrie, seen here, by the way, at the Loose Memorial, a place called Dud Corner, they spend years and years searching for John's body. And every time Rudyard, who becomes a a big player in the first Imperial Wargraves Commission before it comes to the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission, goes to the battlefields. He's looking to try and find graves of Irish guards, and he's always spending time searching the loose battlefields. He dies without ever knowing that John's body's been discovered, as does his wife, as does John's sister. So there is no more Kipling family. Um, but interestingly, we know that Rudyard actually comes to St. Mary's ADS in the 1920s, and he tours the cemetery. And as was his practice at the time, he would go to every Irish guard's grave he could see. So I think there's a very high chance he actually stood at this grave at the time that it was an unknown lieutenant of the Irish guards. And there weren't many unknown lieutenants missing in that area of the Irish guards. I wonder if he wondered at that time whether he was standing at John's grave. Um, today, of course, we know that he was.
So just to round up, the casualties at the Battle of Luce, um, British, if you include the October fighting and the subsequent attack to the north with the 2nd Division, about 59,000 big, big casualties. Um, about 25 to 30% of those guys are going to be killed in action. It's fairly typical in the Great War. German casualties, about 26,000. What the Brits show is that it is possible to achieve a break-in in the Great War, but it's very hard to achieve a breakthrough. Um, this is a really a really important difference, and it's actually going to change to a switch in tactics to what we sometimes refer to as bite and hold, which is going to be a, a key part of the coming Battle of the Somme in 1916. So to round off then, a couple of lessons learned here. I'll just rattle through them very quick. Artillery. Artillery is not good enough. There's not enough shells. They're not good enough at wire cutting. The shell quality is, is too low. Aerial reconnaissance, really important, particularly in targeting dug-in enemy machine guns and pinpointing those for the artillery. This is going to be really become an art by 1917. But using aerial reconnaissance to, to highlight and identify key enemy strong points is going to be a really big deal. Light fighting order is debuted at, at um, the Battle of Luce for the first time. So that's men not taking their great coats and packs and things into battle. Seems pretty obvious to us today, but light fighting order is used with reserve waves then bringing up um, more slowly heavy kit and things like tools for reversing trenches. Uh, gas does have potential, as do a number of new weapons, but it's not. It's a bit of a one-trick pony, um, and it certainly shouldn't be used alone. Um, it still needs to be in tandem with an artillery bombardment. Uh, the pigeon there, old speckled Jim, this is a communications issue. Communications, you need multiple sources of communications methods all across the battlefield. You need runners running multiple routes in different directions. You need landlines to send messages back. You need homing pigeons to run messages back in different ways. You need semaphore, all of these, because communication breaks down so quick once the, once the bullets start flying. Um, and the cemetery there, Doug Corner, um, is just a, a reminder for me, really, that you know, courage is is quite often not enough, um, as tragic as that is, because there's a damn lot of courage in 1915. Really, all of those lessons are not going to come together until 1918 and probably the August of that year, when the Battle of Amiens or even July, the Battle of Le Hamel, where all arms warfare is going to come about. And eventually all branches of the British military can work together to create a, um, a, what I think is a remarkable um, series of victories in 1918.